Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. I started my own business and I, I went out on my own. And, um, and that was good. I was like 28, I, you know, 10 foot tall and bulletproof and indestructible. Um, and I worked for six months and I got the opportunity to go and work overseas. Now, after being a big hero and saying I'm never going to work for anybody else, I took the opportunity, I went and worked for someone. This guy, same thing, mate. Bad businessman, bad business decisions. I'm in a different country. Um, I'm being affected weekly on a guy making bad business decisions oh. and his business decisions would then affect me getting paid that week or that mm. month. And it reassured me, like, no, nah, fuck it. Bet on yourself, man. Like, just, just back yourself in. Mate, you can lose money, but at least you are in control and you make the decisions about, about your life and your business and how you want to do things and how you want to conduct yourself and how you want to be seen. Hmm. Um, you know, I, 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 in that case, I'd turn up and I'd be getting abused by clients because of decisions that the boss had made. And I'm like, mate, this shit's got to stop. Like, if I'm going to get abused by someone, it's going to be something that I've done or said or a decision I've made, not some other clown's ass. Yeah, because when you make a, a, a bad or a wrong decision or, a, or considered a failure in your own business and your own journey, you can reflect and as long as you reflect and, and go, okay, how can I do that differently? Whereas if they don't reflect and they don't look at it differently, you, you've got your hands tied. You're in a catch-22 position, aren't you? A hundred percent. And it just... Um... You know, that was the thing. Like, you kept making the same stupid decisions over and over again. And you're like, fuck, man, I'm not getting paid. Like, I haven't been paid in three months. That's class like, insanity, I believe, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it is, isn't it? If you're like, making the same mistake, we're not changing it. That's insane. But then he's got other people trying to advise him, you know, we need to do this and we need to we need to put a stop in place and we need to start doing things better. And he just, yeah, 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 yeah. And then fucking go back to the way he was doing it. And you're like, dude, like. Like, I haven't been paid. Like, I'm living on the skin of my ass by by decisions you're making. Like, if I'm going to live on the skin of my ass, at least it's, I want it to be on my mistakes, not someone else's. So from that moment for you then, is that was that the creation? Did you come back to Melbourne then or did you create something whilst you were overseas and then bring it back? Is that the formation creation of Candio or? No, I started Candio in 2006. Um and in January 2007, I, I went to the Middle East. Um, I went, um, I went, I'd had a company that had been asking me for a while. Um, originally, I was, I was married and, um, and they were, they were asking me to go over on, you know, a three year deal. And that meant, you know, moving myself, moving my wife, like relocating, um, to a country that we really didn't know a lot about. You know, there's a lot of obviously, um, you know, stigma with moving to Middle Eastern countries and for females and things like that. Like, Especially at that time. Yeah. And you know what, mate? Like, the, the honest truth, man, living in Dubai is the bloody safest place I've ever felt. Oh, like, really? Honest truth. And, and, um, you know, even even female friends over there and stuff like that, like felt safe. So, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about about um, those sorts of those sorts of places to live. Um, mm. it, it's sad because there's some real beautiful things about the country, and there's some again some amazing learnings that I got while I was over there. Mm. Um, but it just you know, just a just a bad rap. People don't do the research. Sadly, we were probably one of them because at the time my wife was in marketing um, and advertising. She would have got an awesome job over there. We probably would have, you know, um, no kids. She would have got a great job. I would have had a job. We could have spent three years and probably either just had the time of our life or actually come back with it, you know, with um, with a with a house in a bank account ready to go, kind of. Yeah. 
So what made um, you not do that then? What was the... Uh... Well, the the marriage broke up. Um, yeah, so that was... Uh, I, uh, the marriage broke up. And the honest truth, mate, I kind of got the... It was three years. The contract was three years. It was two years. It was one year. Um, they got me on a six week contract to um, to go and design the garden for a school, like a brand new school that was being built. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is pretty cool. I'll go for six weeks and just just get away, go and hide for six weeks in the desert. It'll be pretty fun. Um, and um, oh, I was there three years. <laughs> right. So that six weeks turned into the three years, and that's yeah. when you were single, obviously, after the separation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'd separated. We weren't um, technically divorced at that time, but we were separated. So, yeah, um, second day second day in the country, my boss said, hey, would you stay for three months? And I'm like, sure. Wow. <laughs> but I was there for the whole first year, and I never unpacked my suitcase. Because <laughs> you like, – why? Yeah. I'd wash all my clothes and I'd repack them back into my suitcase. I literally lived out of my suitcase. Thinking never, you were going to go at any point? Or? Mate, I just never trusted the – I just never fully trusted it. Like, wow. um, yeah, and it just, you know, you go over there and you, you go to work for the first day and your boss goes, oh, I need your passport. And you're like, what for? And he goes, oh, we put it in the safe here. We, you know, we I'm like, you're not getting my fucking passport, man. That's fucking odd. And he, he goes, no, nah, it's how it's done over here. I go, mate, if that's if you want my passport, I'm going back to the airport. I'm going home. Yeah. And he's like, what do you mean? I go, you're not getting my fucking passport, mate. I don't know whether it's an Australian thing, but no. you, you're not. That passport ain't leaving my side. He's probably th- he's pro- he, more likely probably innocent and not thinking that there's any, you know, bad. he's planning on doing anything. But... It, it's probably like he says it's normal, but he has to look at it from the other perspective. It's only normal because some people have been dodgy with it and kidnapped them essentially. No, you know, not yeah. tying them up. I don't mean that sense, but forcing them to stay when something goes horrible. Well, you want that safety piece, don't you? Hundred percent. And so oh. you can't go to the airport and leave. It's <laughs> it's and it's weird, man. Like, and I'm just like, dude, that is, it's not going to happen. Like, so what did he say? How did you get out of that one? I just said no, way. like fucking no way, mate. I'm not handing my passport over. I'm and six he... foot seven, bitch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was it was a heated conversation. Was and it? He's like, you know, this is how things are done here. I go, well, if that's how it's done, I'm I'm out of here. Like, I'm fucking going to the airport. I'll get back on a plane and I'll I'll leave today. Like, it's just if if that's the only option I have, I'm out. That's a deal breaker. So how did that conversation end? I kept my passport. <laughs> but your relationship connection? I am six foot seven. <laughs> <laughs> and he's five foot one. Um, what was his, what was your relationship after that then? Um, oh, look, we were good until I wasn't getting paid. And then, oh. yeah, then, then it. Oh, that was the bad relationship guy. Yeah. Yeah. Bad, a businessman guy. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. I don't know. I've only met one person that smokes camel cigarettes, and it was him. And so now I have this real distrust of people who smoke camel cigarettes. That's fair. That's totally fair. Um, so let's let's just briefly go back to um, another thing you do. Let's talk about basketball briefly. Um, yeah. Basketball, what you're doing right now, you're – you're leading your own way in a different sense of the game of basketball, aren't you, at the moment? And it's fascinating. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you've been doing for the last decade or so? Um, yeah. So I'm currently I, I coach. I, I now, um, you know, I, I now got to a point where, you know, I can't do what I think I used to be able to do on a basketball court. So yeah. I kind of tell other people how they should be doing it. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I'm I'm a coach. Uh, I've turned into a coach. I love it. I've kind of coached on and off right the way through. I think the first time I coached, I coached under like mini ball under under eights or something, and I was twelve. Yeah. And my mum was kind of officially the coach, but I did all the coaching, and she just kind of babysat, made sure everybody was was kind of cool and everything was okay. So, um. You know, I've I've done it right the way through my career in bits and pieces. Um, 
I love it. Again, you know, like I had such a, like a career that I think was quite privileged and, and you know, some really amazing opportunities uh, gifted to me. Um, and I always have felt, you know, quite, quite strongly about giving, giving back and, and sort of sharing some of the, being coached by some amazing coaches as well. So, um, you know, sharing some of that knowledge and passing it down the line, I think is, is a really, um, you know, something that, that really should, should be done. Um, but I, for the last 10 years, I've been the head coach of the Australian deaf basketball team. So, um, yeah, coach, coach, um, deaf or hard of hearing athletes in, in, in basketball. That's amazing because until I met you, I never, I suppose, I don't know. I don't even, you know, I have to say, I don't believe I even knew, uh, you know, you, obviously you go to, not that this is in the same category, but you know, uh, you, you know about the um, Paralympics and, and things like that, you know, that exists cause it gets, it's, it's on, t it is on TV, maybe not as much as the, the other Olympics, but I, I, I didn't know that existed until I met you and I found it fascinating and it's, it's incredible. Um, how did you get into that? And, and are you, how's that going for you at the, at the moment? Yeah, I guess from that point of view, mate, don't, don't feel bad. Like it's, um, you know, that's probably one thing that I've been trying to, trying to work on is, um, you know, along with Deaf Basketball Australia, again, I, I, I say me, it's not just me. There's, you know, there's a whole group of people that are involved and, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of passionate people um, that are that are trying to to grow the sport in the deaf and hard of hearing space as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I say me, and when I say that, please don't think, oh, I can check out the arrogance on this bloke. There, there's yeah, there's a lot of people there with me. But, yeah. you know, we, we, we are trying to grow um, – the, the understanding, the acceptance, get it out to the, the population. Like when you think about it, I, th I think it's about 10% 10 10 of the population are, are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, wow. So it, 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 it is a small group. So, um, you know, and then how many of that population actually play basketball or love basketball or want to play elite basketball? So you, you're talking about a, a pretty small um you know, a, a real minority of the Australian population that we're we're trying to get to, but yeah. it is about you know sharing the knowledge to to people because you you may know someone who's got a deaf or hard of hearing child now. Like you know, you're going to school, your um, you know your son's involved in basketball. Like you kind of never know, and you just sort of hope that the more people we can reach, the more people. It you know six degrees of separation that that it um it, the snowball effect that that find out about us but you know we I only just recently found out that there's an Australian midget basketball team um wow. so it's you know it's just trying to share share that understanding that there are these teams out there for for these groups of people who who just want to play basketball man I love and. That. And would love to represent their country, and that's 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 where we are. So, um, well, yeah, Brent, it's... I have got some notes. I have got some photos if I can share. Um, <laughs> some which Brent did share, and uh, there's one behind me. I'll bring that up to the camera. This is a team squad of Brent and his players. Absolutely incredible. Cool. Sorry about that, Brent. And uh, yeah. a cool photo of. A, a, a bird, a bird, uh, bird view. Bird, um, I, I can't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, looking down view. Uh, looking down view. <laughs> Bird's eye view. That's what I was going for. <laughs> um, Brent here doing his thing. Not shouting. I hope Brent. <laughs> Because me as a coach, I get myself into a, tr a lot of trouble these days. Uh, and um, as a as a bit of a coach. Oh, I've shown that one. This one. Talk to us a bit briefly before we go into the journey of uh, Australia basketball. But um, what happened here? What did what did you uh, win? Okay, that is um, that is us winning Asia Pacific Deaf Games um, in two thousand and fifteen, um, and that also qualified us for the Deaf Olympics in Turkey in two thousand and seventeen. So wow, um, yeah, it was. Pretty special moment. It was the first time an Australian deaf team had won a gold medal in any international competition. 
Um, yeah, so there was some, it was kind of pretty special things that came about that. That team was named as Deaf Sports Australia Team of the Year that year. Um, yeah, which was awesome. Um, you know, group of group of young guys that um, that just you know really got in and believed in what we were doing and 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 chased a dream and were able to become that that first Australian deaf team to to actually win a gold medal at any international event. So um, you know, it, it was just it was crazy. It was a, a surreal experience, uh, amazing moment. Um, something that I'll cherish for, for forever. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. I love it. And so, I mean, apart from winning uh, and putting the team on the map in that way, uh, what are the other ways of reaching people and making people aware that this is a, is a, is occurring in the world? Is there a, yeah. So when when I got involved in the team, we had um, the first first training camp I ever went to. We had six people turn up. Hmm. Um, there was six guys turn up and then we we're just about in September this year. Um, we're going to hold the Asia Pacific deaf basketball championships, um, in Melbourne at state basketball center out at one Turner. Um, and that is again, our qualifying for deaf Olympics, which is being held in Tokyo next year, November, 2025. Um, so that's our qualifying tournament. Um, we held tryouts October, November last year for the Asia Pacific um, team, and we had 29 people turn up to the tryout days. So, um, you know, and some of them were kids. Like we had 15, 16-year-olds turn up. So we're actually growing the next generation of um, Australian deaf basketballers. When I got involved... There was a, a women's team, a, a deaf women's team as well. Um, it only lasted a couple of months. Um, I, I wasn't involved in that. I've only been involved in the men's program. But numbers were waning. Um, it just wasn't getting the push that probably I injected into the men's team. Mm -hmm. um, and it just kind of fell over and, and went away. And... At Asia Pacific Deaf Basketball Championships in September this year, it's going to be the first time in that ten years um, that we've got a women's team competing as well. Amazing! So, um, you know, just 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 trying to push, trying to grow it, um, trying to get out there, trying to market it, um, having conversations with Basketball Australia, um, you know trying to get to as many tournaments as we can to compete using my own um, kind of um, social media and platforms and things like that to grow um, to to grow the understanding and awareness through the basketball community yeah. like I, I you know I've been around it my whole life I started playing when I was five so you know you think about the amount of people that have been on teams with me and, you know, 10 people per year over, you know, 40 years has, has been a lot of basketball, a lot of faces. So just trying to, trying to share it, trying to, um, trying to grow it, trying mm. to com um, treat it like a, uh, like an elite professional program has been a really huge step. Um, the one thing I did when I took over was treat the guys like basketball players. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like, and it sounds like something really simple, but everybody in the past has treated them treated them really like deaf guys playing basketball. Mm. And I, I kind of just went in going, okay, I'm I'm going to treat them like basketball players, and the the guys. I think for the most part have appreciated it. Um, yeah, but but it's just it's a, it's a really simple mindset shift, but something that made a massive amount of difference. And then if you're treating them like basketball players, you can hold them to different accounts. Mm. Um, people, you know, can be accountable for different things. So, um, yeah that that was a, that was the biggest 
biggest change I made. And it, like I said, it seems simple, seems easy, but it was it was a huge thing. Well, it is huge, but it should be simple, and it should be because I always have the analogy is that you know we all stand on this planet. We all share this planet. You, st- you deserve to stand on this piece of soil just as much as I do. I don't care if you're worth $2 billion. I don't care if you're worth $100 million. I don't care if you're the big CEO of a business. I'm not going to be intimidated by whoever it may be or look at them differently. They, they, do, be, they do deserve to be uh, on that team just like anybody else. And I think they needed somebody like yourself to come in and, and, and do that. With that in mind, though, what complications did you come across as a coach? Uh, because obviously I, I've learned Auslan, which is the Australian sign language um, yeah. for those who are listening outside of Australia. Um, I've We've had Auslan in schools and, uh, and I'm learning and it's difficult. And I, you know, I, I struggle with that side of things. I, I learned a couple of things and it's fascinating. I'd love to learn more. But what complications came with your job going coaching the Australian deaf team? Um, well, the first complications, like there's so many levels to it. Um, and it, it can be a real minefield to try and navigate sometimes, but the, the biggest complication is staring you right in the face. Like we've got a communication barrier. Okay. So the, what the communication barrier and, and how it is, there's levels to that. But the, ultimately, we've got a communication barrier. So the first thing that I wanted to do was obviously simplify how we're going to play basketball. So you, you just strip basketball back to its bare essentials, really, and then you rebuild the game. So if on a hearing team, like as a coach, you want your team talking and communicating, okay? Like it's massive. Like yeah. I, I coach, I coach, you know, NBL one, you know, professional, semi-professional guys down here at, at Geelong. Mm. Um, I'm an assistant coach for Geelong United. Um, there, like we're always preaching talk, talk, talk on D, talk, communicate, you know, like, okay. So this huge part of our game is gone. Yeah. So you've actually just got a hand signals, like physically touching people and moving people. Um, and then when you get into communication, you've also got to like, so we have, we have guys, there's a level of, there's a level of deafness that you um, need to be at to compete internationally. So the level is 55 decibels in your best ear. Which fifty five decibels is pretty loud, right? So, and that's in your best ear. So you, when we compete, you cannot wear hearing aids or implants or cochlear. Like there's nothing. You, you, you. Everybody's competing at this fifty five or lower level. Fascinating. So, then we've got guys who have grown up their whole life with cochlear implants or hearing aids. They've essentially, you know, they're they're deaf or hard of hearing, but they've grown up in a hearing world. So yeah. some of the guys on our team don't don't use Auslan. Okay. So then you've got guys that lip read. Then you've got guys that can hear a little bit. Um and then you've got guys that only do little bits of all of the above. Um, so yeah, there's 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 other communication issues like mm. so how do you communicate with someone who's got cochleas, but when they take their cochleas off, you can't hear anything. The surgery removes your hearing completely, um, but then they don't sign or they don't lip read because they've always grown up with. Cochlear, like because they don't need to because of that. Yeah, because right. so there's I, there's crazy levels of it. Yeah, and it's something that would again would never have crossed my mind. I bet it didn't for you when you entered the job line either, right? No, nah, it's uh, yeah. That was the first few training camps were absolutely exhausting. Yeah, well. you, you have to be on. You have to be concentrating. 
you have to be facing. Um, I have an interpreter with me all the time, so um, which is which is awesome. We've we've got an amazing interp- interpreter. He's one of the best in Australia. You'll see him on social media stuff. Um, he does a lot of gigs and bands, and he's like the um, the. <laughs> One of Australia's like he got he got a bit of popularity during COVID because he was doing a lot of TV stuff, um, TV government TV announcements in Queensland. So his name's Mikey Webb. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a legend, but he's um, yeah, you'll see him on a lot. He does a lot of theatre bands. Um, he actually interpreted for Barack Obama when he was out here. Last wow. year, like so, he's done some some pretty cool stuff. Yeah. So I have I have Mikey with me, um, pretty much all the time, or an interpreter, um, and I'm like you, I'm loud, I'm active, a lot of hands. Yeah. And and you have to calm all that down. And early on, I'd have Mikey with me, and he'd be going, "Put your hands in your pocket." <laughs> And it was like, because I'd be doing things and then the minute my hands start to move, you see guys look at my hands trying to understand the sign, but I'm not doing anything. I'm just. It's meaningless to them. Yeah. So I'd slow down, cross your arms, put them behind your back, put them in your pocket. That's hard. Be... It's actually personality, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Right. It's been amazing, mate. It has been unbelievable for my levels of communication. I want to come like, to. I want to come I, to watch a game. Eye really. contact. Yeah. Slow down. I mean, I still. Yeah, uh, I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but. Um, I mean, there's photos that you've seen of me coaching, and I'm just raging it. <laughs> yeah, well, oh, I was going to show you. I was going to show one of them on the on the show, but I didn't want to paint you as a bad person. <laughs> Everyone can just go to Brent's Facebook page, uh, page and if, uh, if he accepts you, you can take a look. But uh, yeah. I think there's an element of this leadership coming into this this space um, of having that perspective and trying to imagine there's empathy and there's perspective that every leader, I believe, are the two traits that every leader should have. And I think it's, is it the sense of going in and going, I need to really imagine what it's like in each of these player's shoes? visualizing yourself on the court and not and it's just being blank you know i don't know yeah how do you do, is, is that what you did i'm v- trying to visualize now if i was the head coach for the deaf team would i go in there and just block everything off and try and communicate that way i don't know what i would do it's, how, did, how did you succeed at that i think i'm i'm a i, I think i've got a pretty good aq uh, i think i'm i'm pretty empathetic but mm. um one thing, one thing I've worked out a long time ago with with dealing with these guys is I, I'll never understand. Yeah, like I I, I can't even pretend. To right. What a what a day in the life of of these guys. You know what they go through. Like, you know, we spend time alone, even though we're hearing things and we get in our own heads. You know, we start mm. thinking about oh, you know, like. Overthinking, think, 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 think. Our brain's going a million miles an hour. You know, like I think I used to, used to do it a bit, like get in my own head when I was working as a gardener, and I'd be on a ride on mower or a lawn mower, and you'd have earmuffs on for just hours and hours and hours on end, and your brain just goes around. Like mm-hmm. now, think about that. Like if you're at home on your own as a as a deaf person and you're not hearing like you it's you and your brain and and you and your the voices in your brain just constantly like so i i've worked out a long time ago i i i i can't i can't even imagine i i don't understand it i don't know if there's a way that i, I can be put in those shoes but it just yeah. you know like these 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 guys just uh, have got a unique experience. But the thing that I do love about the basketball team is when you see new guys, and some of them are young. You got to remember, we got like there. There's been an under twenty ones team on and off over the years, but we can't like. There's not consistent competitions to to have that going like 
all the time. So it sort of comes and goes. So we have, like, we'll encourage younger kids to come down, meet the team. You know, we'll put them into some drills and sort of make them feel welcome. But the the thing that I love about the team is we're putting guys, you know, there's some some guys that have never met other other deaf people. Yeah. And yeah. then all of a sudden you're putting a group of people together who understand what it's like. I, I don't understand what it's like on a day-to-day basis, but these, these group of guys, they do. So all of a sudden they've got this connection. They've, they've got this support base. They've got this connection. They they understand. They get it. Um, not all their circumstances are the same. You know, like I said, cochlear's hearing aids, yeah. some hearing, no hearing. Like, um, but they all have this this common understanding, and, and and they have they have empathy for each other. Yeah. So well, it's like when I meet an English person here. In England, we probably have the worst connection because you have a rivalry of some kind, whether it's football or whatever it may be. You don't might not like that city, but when I have meet an English person here, I feel connected to them. It's yeah. that psychological uh, barrier that's broken down, isn't it? And you feel connected with everything you've just said in there, though. Um, has there ever been a barrier because you're not in that community? Well, I mean, you are, but I mean, personally, you, you've been brought into it. <laughs> Has there ever been that barrier between? You guys, as the coach and the players being deaf, join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.